we acknowledge the desire of most citizens of the world to have a, <clears throat> to create a better place, to create a better environment <clears throat> worldwide. But we also acknowledge the mess that is in the world. So how can we get involved with the intention to make the world better without contributing to the mess? So we've discovered or talked about two possibilities that enhance the potential for that to happen. The one is mind training or meditation, peaceful abiding. That's uh, the development of mindfulness and the development of concentration, two of the factors of the Eightfold Path. The other is what we talked about the last time we got together, which was, which is enfacement or eradicating the defilements of consciousness. And it listed 44 specific intentions. And I won't repeat them today, but does everyone remember most of them? Yes? Okay. I think what it points to in that sutta on effacement is to remind us that as we go about setting our intention and effecting our intention to make the world a better place to live in for all people, it's not about making the world a better place. Or it's not about putting our hands on the world to make that different. It's about making ourselves different. In the suit on the effacements, it tells us that we should not be cruel. It didn't say to make the cruel man or cruel woman not cruel. It says we practicing effacement, practicing rubbing out of defilements that we will not be cruel here. Doesn't say anything about the other guy. Now again, in comparison to other spiritual f practices, we have the great instruction that says, get the mote out of your eye before you worry about the splinter in your brother's eye. So again, telling us where to put our focus, where to, what and where to work on that will make our intention successful. So it's very important for us to know that, very important for us to do that, very important for us to understand that meditation, mind training in and of itself, that whole creation of stillness and tranquility, emptiness, voidness, all of that, all of that is a part of the training. All of that is good for us. But it is not all of the training. That we must be very active in depressing our own tendencies that cause confusion and pain and hurt in the world. In the Kalama Sutta, which is my favorite Sutta, it speaks to us, it says, maybe it would be a good idea. Now this is after we step up to the line, after we state our intentions of making the world a better place doing something or creating something, an environment that is healthier, wholesomer, kinder, gentler. It says, it may be a good idea for all of us, for everyone who has that intention, for everyone who's trying to make America great again, to go beyond our own opinions 
beliefs, and dogmatic thinking. In this way, we can rightly reject anything which, when accepted, practiced, and perfected, leads to more anger, criticism, conceit, frustration, pride, greed, or delusion. That's our litmus. That's our filter. Again, we don't argue that there are many people from all persuasions, from all cultures, from all tribes who are wanting to see a better place, not only in America, but in the world. We come with our opinions and we come with our attitudes and we come with our defilements. And what is created is the world that we see ourselves in today. It may be a good idea for all of us to go beyond our own opinions, our own beliefs, our own dogmatic thinking. In this way, we can rightly reject anything which, when accepted, practiced, and perfected, leads to more anger, criticism, conceit, frustration, pride, greed, and delusion. These unwholesome states of mind are universally condemned and are certainly not beneficial to ourselves or to others. These unskillful ways of acting and thinking are best to be avoided whenever possible. On the other hand, we can rightly accept anything which when practiced and perfected leads to unconditional love, contentment, and soft wisdom. These things allow us to develop a happy, tranquil, and peaceful mind. Thus the wise praise all kinds of unconditional love, loving acceptance of the present moment, tranquility, contentment, and gentle wisdom. And they encourage everyone to practice these uplifting qualities as much as possible. Remember that embedded in all of us is the desire to be a bodhisattva, to, to help people who are in pain, to rid the world of wrongness or incorrectness, evil. But the way to do that is to heal ourselves, to work on ourselves, to get the moat out of our eyes. to let go of our beliefs, our opinions, and to use the filter of harmlessness to govern our intentions and to govern our actions. This is critical because if we don't use that filter, we will just contribute to the state of consciousness that is observable in the world today. People yelling at each other, people shaming each other, people tweeting at each other, people just doing all types of horrific things in the name of goodness and then stating that all they want to do is make it great. So, it's not about not doing anything. It's not about putting our heads in the sand. It's not about hiding from responsibility. It's not about ignoring or turning our backs on the pain and suffering of our brothers and sisters. It's not about any of that. But it is about remembering to be qualified to do this work, this spiritual work, this ethical work. We must be spiritual and we must be ethical. We can't do it otherwise. We can't bring the energy otherwise because we won't have the energy to bring. We will only have our intention, our, our desire to make it better, make it good. So for each and every one of you, I'm just asking you with, from the bottom of my heart, 
to do the work that needs to be done before you do the work that needs to be done. All right. Unconditional love. <clears throat> Unconditional love. Now this causes us to not embrace condemnation. Not embrace the shaming of the other group and telling them that they're no good. It means being able to love those or to love everyone in spite of their deficiencies. Reminding ourselves that we're also deficient, that we, and even if we are in that moment perfect, that we just became that way, that we weren't that way all the time. Are there any questions? Yes. Mark brought up a good point the other day. We were talking in the kitchen, mm -hmm. and he was mentioning that um, in order to do this work that you speak of, it's almost need to, it needs to be done as a community because working with the mind is a timely thing. So it's in the moment to see how you react to a situation or how the mind has been trained. You know, back in the day, many people went away for 12 years with a master one-on-one -on -one, to work on this work of the mind to transform and refine it mm -hmm. and i'm just thinking i'm trying to do this you know in my own journey in my own way in a community with guidance of books and um you know um talks and things like that however i feel deep in my heart as mark does that this needs to be done almost like a one-on-one -on -one process so this work that we speak of i mean this is some intense stuff that it's hours a day i feel i mean i've been doing this for some time and i see improvements i do um but to get to that wholeness that pureness that completeness i mean there needs to be some serious years of training i feel so i just want your opinion on that there are people who believe that it is necessary to have a teacher, um, someone who's wiser than yourself, someone who can let you know when you're reacting or acting incorrectly. But that's not the only way. What we're talking about today is being able to learn from our sincere participation in life, using as a filter or a guideline things that we consider to be wholesome and uplifting. So we can look back at our perceived immaturity and say that when we didn't know better, we needed someone to tell us what to do. But most of us here know better. Most of us here have had enough life experiences to know how we should relate and respond and how we shouldn't. We have, we're also given a suggestion that says, when in doubt, think about how you would want the other to treat you. Think about how you would want the other to talk to you. Think about how you would want the other to guide or lead you. And then with that information, retrieving that information, 
that is the wisdom that should be able to guide us to do the right thing or to relate or have relationship in the right way. So I think we have, we're talking about feedback. You know, how do I feel when a person says this or does this to me? Am I hurt? Am I, do I have a feeling of rejection? Do I have a feeling of them being unkind to me? And if I have that feeling, to make sure that I don't do that to others. So, it would depend upon whether we have a connection to uh, the loop of wisdom, whether we feel adequate enough in our own path, along our own journey, are we treating others the same way we want to be treated? You know, are we doing things to others that we wouldn't want done to us? And are we responsive to that feedback? If we are, then we're okay. We're, we're sort of qualified to be self-taught. But if we find ourselves doing things to others that we would not want done to ourselves, and we can't really reason why we do it. We just know that we do it, but we can't stop ourselves. Although we know we wouldn't be able to accept it if it, did, if it was done to us, then we need a, an external teacher. That would be the way I would work with it. Yeah. Makes sense? I think um, the mind, so the golden rule is what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And the mind is programmed in a certain way, you know, for how we want to be treated, the mind, because that's really kind of what it is, I think. Okay. Um, then we'll treat others that way. <laughs> like, for example, somebody who, I mean, I would be on time for somebody else because I would appreciate the same thing. I mean, something as little as that. Okay. And how I'm, how I think about the analogy of what you're saying is we're all apprentices, for example. And let's say we're learning to be blacksmiths, but we don't have a master to show us the way, so we're just put in a shop and we just kind of feel around and learn and it takes more time. And you know, we might get burned on the same machine six times. But we just continue and then finally the seventh time we learn, oh, if I put my hand that way, I'm not going to get burned. Finally, the seventh time. Mm -hmm. So I think it just takes longer. Like, you have to be extra committed. I mean, I don't know. That's how I feel. Does that make sense? If it makes sense to you. <laughs> there is a, a point of view that we're not all apprentices, but we're all masters. We've just forgotten that. Well, ultimately, no one is. <laughs> okay. yeah. But as long as we live in that realm of duality. No, I appreciate what you're saying. I appreciate what you're saying. Like being here in the last month or so, this has made more sense to me in the last year. So I really do appreciate and respect what you say, I just, it's a hard question. It really it's, is. Uh, it's complicated. It's a very complicated question. I, I, I'll bring it over to Mark, but I, I think one of the things that, uh, when, what you've mentioned, which, you know, is the fact how helpful it has been to be around people who you feel it's easier to practice with. Right. You know, I, and, and, and I think that's true. You know, it is. Uh, and so that's a resource you have. And, uh, and it's always nice to have people to practice with, you know, but uh, yeah. So, yeah, I, I remember, you know, talking about supportive community. I remember uh, when I first started my year up at Yogaville and I was talking with one of the veterans 
And he said, well, you know, the thing that I like about being here, uh, he said, is that, you know, we all screw up at times. But at least I know that everyone here is working on their stuff. And so we can help process. So. Man, that was really that was really the point that there's just um, there's an opportunity for a richness of of um, just opportunities to learn and grow in this kind of an environment that a lot of us aren't accustomed to. And, and the example that I gave Amy was I have a brother who I'm very close to, and I, I love him to death, and I think he loves me. Um, but uh, politically, we have very different views, and we do not talk politics anymore because we cannot because um, he does not have the capacity to, to dialogue with someone who has a view that's uh, other different. than his own. And so we actually don't have the contact we used to, but also we're not learning anything from each other, whereas my father and I also have very different political views. But for some reason, the mutual love and respect is such that we can... Um, you know, we can dialogue. Now we call each other names a lot, but it's you know, it's a you know, always out of love. But but the the thing I've learned, you know, I assumed going into our dialogues most recently about politics post the most recent presidential election, um, I, I thought I was really going to be able to educate him because you know it was so clear that I was right and he was wrong, and. Um, you know, as we continued to talk, you know, he made it very clear to me something that I missed. And as Mark, you're doing the same thing I'm doing. You're every bit as arrogant as I am with regard to your positions. Um, I hear the anger. I hear all the things you're saying that I have on the other side. Now, you have the the politically correct position right now uh, so you think you have the high ground but you're doing the same thing and I didn't see it but because he's able to bring me back in these dialogues regularly and he loves pointing it out but but he's right and I have learned and grown so much from those interactions uh, in ways that I don't think I would have had I not been able to to, to have those opportunities with someone who, like you said, was was willing to listen, but then also willing to, you know, tell me what, what I needed to hear. So uh, I think more broadly that's sort of the, the opportunity we have in a situation like this where everybody's consciously, you know, working on it. Just one quick thing. I think ultimately, though, you have to remember, you know, the book if, or the saying, if you meet the Buddha on the road, kill him because he's a false Buddha because the Buddha is within. And I think that's what our excellent teacher is saying in that you, you can be self-taught for the most part, but there's a lot of great things that you can learn from yourself. Thank you. I want to talk to you some more about perfection. About what? Perfection. Okay. Since you ended it with that one, I wanted to know, because there, there's a moment of knowing that you are perfect, but you're also then in the next moment working with a new relationship with somebody that you now are going to come with a remembrance of that deficiency state so that you can relate is that am i understanding you a little bit more about that point <laughs> we've got to be willing to let go of our perceived perfection to be perfect As long as I think I'm perfect, then I'm going to be in error. Thank you. Does that help? Yes. Uh, yeah, that makes me think of something. If you're concerned about yourself being perfect, you're separating yourself from others. And I 
think I'm really coming to the big conclusion that that's not what we need to do. We need to understand that we're all part of the same thing and we aren't we aren't we're unique but we're really not unique we're part of the same dust from the stars that created us and that's really what it's about and if people realize those kinds of things we wouldn't be uncivil, we wouldn't have this disharmony, we wouldn't have what's going on, but we can't seem to grasp that idea. And that's the crux of the whole deal. Okay. You know, so awareness, self-awareness is about all you can do. That's the starting point. Not looking for a teacher to tell you this or a book or a this, whatever. It's being honest and recognizing what you're doing, and then you take it from there to have some kind of wisdom develop. But it's hard being honest and saying, hey, uh, be a little kinder. Okay. Is there any chance you could uh, unpack oneness a little more? I was at the kitchen table today and um, talking about, we were talking about oneness, so obviously I'm separate from it at that moment. And then the person to, in front of me mentioned oneness and other people's, how they practice oneness. And um, she makes this example of, you know, what do you do when your neighbor asks you to do something and you don't want to do it? And I said, well, that's oneness manifesting as a aversion. And uh, that's, that's a one sense of it. And then, so we're talking about it. So we're, we're, we're kind of uh, searching for some clarity and then getting a sense of, you know, how does the, the heart, you know, have a, a unison where we're beating in, in, in the um, rhythm. And then the actions of oneness, of course, as Phyllis was saying, would make no sense that you would do anything other than treat people with all these qualities because you'd be kind of practicing on yourself and you wouldn't be harming yourself and beating yourself with all your faults and all the things, your, your shortcomings, because that would separate yourself. So what are the facets in unpacking of oneness as well as me relaxing enough when it starts getting a sense of a, a, a non-duality, a separation? which has its own magic and we can do so much even with a, a non-dual perspective. Um, so what are the continued process of, of how do we cultivate our own uniqueness as well as a community that obviously has an inherent sense of oneness? It's very difficult to discuss oneness And what Phyllis was pointing at was you got to practice oneness. You got to believe in it. And then you've got to live it. As long as you see another who you have to teach, then that's duality, that's separation. It is my opinion that as long as you're capable and able to see the other as yourself, then you're on the road to unity. I don't believe that we are a part of any whole. We are the whole. As long as I see myself and you as different or me being a part of you, then I'm acknowledging that there's 
a part of me that's not included because there's a part of, a part of me that is. So there's a part of me that isn't. The, the teachings express that the way to do it is to dismantle the concept of self. And if you do that, there is nobody else outside of the all that is existing. As long as you still think that there is a me that has to be something or do something, then you have divisiveness. Okay. So just keep taking apart, deconstructing the belief that you are somebody and the rest of it will fall in place. Remember all of this started because we became self-conscious. We saw ourselves and God as separate. We, feel, we felt that because of our perceived nakedness that we could hide from God, which makes us then forget that we are God. It's that simple. Just be. You know, we had all of these very clear instructions not very long ago where we would ask ourselves or we were asked to ask ourselves in a particular situation, what would Jesus do? What would God do? What would Buddha do? And then do it. Because then that would mean that you are no less or no, you're no longer your own self, but you are the Buddha or you are Jesus or you are God or you are consciousness, you are higher consciousness. What would they do? And then do that and you become them and you, you then not become yourself. And therefore there is no division. There is just unity or community. There is no me and you. There is just is, thisness. So, in the meantime, continue to work on your descent into voidness, your descent into emptiness, your dissolution of a self into something that is more than self or that is a constitute of the whole. So, that's where you were. Hard to lose it, hard to give it up, because we've worked so hard to create it. But it's not serving us. We see the world, we see the confusion in the world, and it's about all of these selves trying to solve a problem when there is no problem except disharmony or discontinuity. That's the problem. We've got to see each other as a continuum of ourselves. And then we'll stop hurting the other. We'll stop mistreating the other. We will stop denying the other. We'll figure a better way to do it because it, it's about me that you're saving yourself. You're not saving the whale. You're saving yourself. Okay. Anyone else? Everyone's good? Let's go inside and peacefully abide for a minute.
So is it um, unreasonable to expect that others will have the same perception that you do? Is that unreasonable? Yes. Yes, it is. Even when you have a group that might have the same common interests, in the moment of experience, everybody there sees it differently. So remembering what Mark said, it's not important that we have agreement on what is. What's important is that we can treat everybody with love, even when they have a different opinion. That's what's important. And that's what the effacements, the practice of the effacements, help us to work with. Because in our quest, in our journey for perfection, what we find is that there is nothing in this world but imperfection. And to try to change that is an impossibility because that's the design flaw, that's the design function of this reality. It's up and down, it's give and take, it's just the way it works. And to want it to work a different way, to want it to be something different, is what causes us our pain. So it is always to remember why we started this journey in the first place. And that was to stop the pain in our heads and to stop the pain in our hearts. That's what we're here to do. We're not here to change reality. We're here to change our relationship with reality to understand it as it really is. Okay. Stop fighting it. All right. Thank you so much. May all beings be liberated from suffering. May we be well. May we be happy. May we be peaceful. Thank you so much. Smile at a stranger. <laughs>